recently in the House of Commons, uh, David Cameron commented that it was always a joy to see Michael Crick. But once, I found myself agreeing with the Prime Minister. It really is um, a great pleasure to welcome Michael Crick to Kent College here today. He claims that he would have had a far more successful career if it hadn't been for his obsession with football. There are one or two people in this audience who might take note of that claim. Today, his lecture is entitled Pursuing Politicians. Simon, so, thank you very much indeed, and thank you uh, to Kent College for inviting me uh, here to Canterbury today. Canterbury uh, was actually the scene of um, one of my greatest journalistic triumphs. It was way back in uh, 1982, 29 uh, years ago, when uh, Pope John Paul II visited Canterbury Cathedral, the first, I think probably the first Pope in history to uh, visit Canterbury Cathedral. Um, and I was part of, I was a very, very junior member of the ITN team, the ITV, uh, was it kind of ITV News Call League, a team that was covering the Pope's tour, and uh, I'd only been in television a couple of years, and there was a little rivalry between us, all, all the journalists in ITN, to see who could uh, doorstep the Pope uh, by, door, you know, get a few words out of him. I mean, this was a pretty, uh, pretty naughty thing to do, and the, the equivalent now would be doorstepping the Queen. You know, you're really, it's sort of forbidden. There's a sort of unwritten rule in uh, television journalism. You do not ask questions of the Queen. Well, in those days, it applied to the Pope as well. So there's this rivalry amongst us all, and uh, uh, I think on the first day somebody managed to get a, a few words in the second day, and then he came to Canterbury, and, I was, and there was no security in them, amazingly little security in those days. Um, and uh, I looked at the route he was taking out of the cathedral, and I said to Jeremy Thompson, our reporter, who was there for ITN, uh, look, if you stand here, Jeremy, um, then I reckon you'll get a few words uh, with the Pope because uh, he's going to have to walk along here very slowly and then turn right. And Jeremy said, no, don't talk rubbish, you know, uh, I'm the, I'm the uh, experienced one, I know what I'm talking about, I shall stand over there. So I said, okay, well you go and stand over there, I'll, I'll stay here, and you, stand, you go over there, and, uh, if you think that's a better spot. Anyway, sure enough, the Pope comes out of the cathedral very slowly, and I have the, the key moment, this is the key to doorstep for people, to ask the question at just the right moment. And I said, Pope John Paul, how important has today been for you? Very important. Very important. I, I was over the moon. I got an interview with the Pope. Well, four words. Uh, two of them repeated. And, you know, this is, uh, you know, my, my future in television was assured. Like. The last 12 months, I think, have been a very revolutionary, maybe a small R, but nonetheless, revolutionary period. 2010, I think, will go down as one of the big years of post-war, certainly, British politics. For the first time in this country, we finally persuaded the leaders of all three major parties to take part in a television debate. Now, many people, myself included, were pretty sceptical about whether this would be at all interesting because the, the rules for the debates were so structured, half a minute here, a minute there, then you're allowed to reply there for half a minute, and you're not, the audience isn't allowed to clap or laugh or do anything like that. And um, the... Uh, uh, but actually, they turned out to be rather interesting. Uh, and um, David Cameron was, came under a lot of criticism <coughs> from members of his own party for allowing Nick McVeigh to participate uh, in these debates. Um, and at the end of the day, Gordon Brown came out of them uh, rather badly. David Cameron, I don't think, improved his reputation really from the three television debates that were held. But the one man whose reputation was hugely improved was uh, Nick Clegg. But the really dramatic thing about the 2010 election, of course, was the result. Because we ended up with a hung parliament. No one party had uh, a majority of seats in the House of Commons. It would require, uh, well, around about 325 seats. The Conservatives got, ended up with three, 307, Labour two, from memory 258, the Liberal Democrat 57. So nobody had um, an overall majority. And uh, there was five days uh, in May, when we all stood around Whitehall wondering what was going to happen next. The first 
coalition in this country uh, for 65 years, not since the Second World War, had two parties uh, agreed to go into government um, with each other. The fascinating thing about this government is that actually, almost across the board in government, it is, it is actually trying to do radical new things. This is a very revolutionary government in terms of what it's attempting to do, not just in terms of the public finances, but in the whole of the public sector. And that's why I think the year 2010 uh, will probably be remembered as a turning point in our um, political history. Uh, I'm told that one of your old girls here is Natasha uh, Engel, the, uh, the Labour MP for, I think, her seat's uh, North East Derbyshire. Uh, she is the chairman of a, a new committee set up in the House of Commons to uh, give uh, more say to backbench members of Parliament, give them the power <coughs> to initiate debates in the way that they've never had in the past. Now, all these things taken together, I, do, I think, represent substantial a substantial shift in our political system, uh, a shift uh, towards a slightly more democratic system, <coughs> a system where it is easier to hold the government to account. I mean, when I started out 30 years ago, uh, you could divide all the news, all of um, going on in the world, really, into left versus right. It was the East versus the West, the Soviet Union as, as uh, against America, capital against labor, um, <coughs> business against the trade unions. Uh, nearly all stories broke down into that. Whereas now, the differences between, the, between what Blair believes in, believed in, and what Cameron believes in, Craig believes in, very, very similar, very, very similar characters. Um, so, uh, and to a large extent, that, that battle between capitalism and socialism between the private sector and the public sector has largely been fought and largely been decided, largely on the side of private enterprise markets, uh, but with uh, a, 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 an important state element. But to a degree, I do still, still think there is uh, an important, still a, 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 an important ideological division between the two, the two major parties, Labour and Conservative. Um, and I suppose you'd sum it up by saying it's whereas the Conservatives think that the state is part of the problem, Labour on the whole think that the, the state is part of the solution. <coughs> but one thing the politics is not going to be in this, in this country for the next few years, it's certainly not going to be dull. Thank you. You spoke of the upcoming vote on AV as being a chance for possible revolutionary change. Do you, do you feel that that opportunity is going to be wasted as it becomes sort of a referendum on the Liberal Democrat Party rather than a debate on the issue itself? Yeah, I mean, how the, how the referendum, I mean, the problem with referendums is, and you, you've seen this abroad where they, in some countries, they have them much more frequently than we do, is that they do become votes of confidence in the particular uh, government at the time. And one sees that a lot in in France, where they always used to be having a referendum. Um, and, um, I mean, in this case, it's particularly complicated because you've got a government of two parties putting forward this referendum when one party believes in, well, actually, neither party really believes in AB. The Liberal <laughs> Democrats want to go beyond AB. They want something that's properly proportional. And the Conservatives, on the whole, don't like it. I think I would get into trouble with that as a comment on which side of that argument is... Uh, um, is, is right. Certainly, I think everybody is going to, uh, uh, most of the population is going to suffer quite significantly in the near future. Um, but uh, it's difficult to see everybody suffering uh, equally. Sorry to be so evasive. I have to be in my position. Yeah. Uh, you just talked about bankers, and I was, uh, I was wondering. You say that today's politics are less ideological. Yes. And I'm wondering how you would respond if I say that in a, in a politics which is largely made up of people who believe in mainly the same thing 
and who don't necessarily respond to the demands of the population, why people should care about politics when the narrow world of Westminster doesn't reflect the pl plurality of political discourse in this country? Very good question. Uh, on behalf of everyone at KC here today, I'd like to thank Mr. Michael Crick for his time and sharing his insights into modern day politics with us. So, on behalf of everyone, thank you very much.